Hey everyone, welcome to Simplexity, where we simplify the complexities of life and bring a little curiosity and contemplation to meaningful and sometimes difficult conversations. I'm your host, Allison Stoner. Why would a NASA rocket scientist leave his research and move to Bhutan to plant hazelnuts? How did the physics of melting wax end up saving thousands of babies' lives? How come we have thousands of urgent articles on climate change, but we fail to mitigate risk or adapt? Let's admit it. We have more scientists than ever before, more data than we ever dreamed, more technology in every aspect in our life. Yet with the wealth of facts, there's a polarization of opinions and paralysis of action. How do we make science count for more than just knowledge creation? When will and how can science translate to legitimate application and breakthroughs in society and for the world? What is that disconnect? That is the precise premise of a revolutionary book I voraciously devoured across a 24-hour period called Impact Science, which explores the weakening link between super smart research-driven scientists in their cool hidden labs and all that cool knowledge actually reaching everyday people, industries, policy, diplomacy, and beyond to make, respectfully, the best real dent in the world. Today, We're lucky enough to have its author on as our guest to discuss everything from moonshot factories to failure culture for progress to the anti-science movement in the West. Bruno Sanchez Andrade Nuno, I really hope I got that right, PhD, (laughs) is an astrophysicist, rocket scientist, and researcher turned impact scientist. He was a member of the Global Future Council on Space, director of science at climate change NGO GAIN, chief scientist at the high-growth startup Mapbox in Silicon Valley, vice president for social impact at Satellogic, and worked at the highest policy levels with World Bank. He spent the last several years traveling around the world serving as advisor and consultant for companies, government bodies, and NGOs, meaning his professional experience spans both academia and the public and private sectors, making him an excellent mediator among a variety of communities. And instead of the common paternal and even patronizing air of some scientists who shout at us to read their facts and do what they say because they're right, Bruno's perspective flips upside down the way we treat and relay science in the modern world. In fact, his passion and versatility are what stood out to me when we first met in the North Pole. Welcome to the show, Bruno. So nice to have you. Thank you, Alison. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, This is going to be a wonderful conversation. So Bruno and I met on a very special expedition that I've referenced in earlier episodes. Would you like to explain Future Talks to everyone? Yes, Future Talk, it was a conference and an expedition, as you say. We went to the northest you can go on a boat without it being like an icebreaker. Besides the fact that we were in a magical place because you had daylight 24 hours, because you are surrounded by a hundred experts in a hundred fields. I really like that conference because usually when you go to conferences, you see experts of one field. Mm. But what I love about this uh, conference, and it was designed to do this, is that if we really want to talk about the future, it's not only the content, the expertise of the people, is how do we work together? How do we put together my skills with your skills, with someone else's skills to truly construct together the future? And I really haven't found many others that are like that. Usually they are more about content and conferences, and this one was truly about connection. I agree. Yeah, we tend to want to impress each other with what we know instead of see how we can work together to actually find the solutions. And so for everyone listening, Future Talks was co-founded by uh, Celia Valista and Camila Soili with a mission to bring together a hundred of the world's most brilliant people, young and old from all sectors and continents on this four day Arctic trip. And we had no Wi-Fi, no cell coverage, and we engaged in the most amazing important discussions of our time, you know, not just world crises, but how can we actually reframe questions and let those questions inspire new innovation? For those of you who are wondering how the hell did you land there, Allison, just really quickly, I wiggled my way in 
with less than 24 hours to go, I saw an advertisement on Instagram that this conference would be taking place. And I saw that one of my friends, Prince E, was going to be a delegate, messaged him, messaged every account I could find associated, and convinced the founder to let me have a bed. And I even said, I will clean toilets, I will cook in the kitchen, just please let me attend. And of course she was going, well, what's your value? And I was going, well, eventually these experts are going to need to communicate to the mass public audience. And oftentimes everything gets lost in translation. I'm a storyteller. I have an audience built in and I would love, I would be honored and privileged to soak in their wisdom and knowledge and, and communicate it to everyone. So that's the backstory. I didn't know uh, you were coming and and when I was told who you were, like, oh, that's fascinating. And I remember I, I felt a little bit like I was maybe avoiding you because I didn't know how to talk to you or what we could mm. talk together. And then I do remember one conversation we had, it was like a couple of hours talking. And those were the most amazing conversations because mm. as you say, it's not only, in my case, for example, it's not only the science that I, I can create, it's not the knowledge. Is how do you get it out there? How do you make people care about it and then do something? Mm. Otherwise, it's going to be just a, a decimal point on an article. Agreed. This whole atmosphere sets the basis for today's talk. I want to just jump right into impact science. Can you explain what impact science is, its mission, and how you found yourself on this side of everything? Impact science is the term that I, I had to come up because I couldn't find something that was out there. I, I don't think the role of a scientist is to just get knowledge. I don't think I'm valuable because I'm a walking dictionary of knowledge. Mm. I think the role of scientists in the world is more for the skills they have. Mm. So when we start talking about how we can understand the problems of the world, many of them have underpinnings that are, are scientific or technical. And we need a role of of a scientist who comes with the skills of understanding. Someone who sits down and says, okay, I have some tools that I learned in, in school or whatever, and I can help you if it's useful to understand the complexities. But with understanding that many of the challenges we have are not only gonna be driven by data or knowledge. There are, there are many times where we make decisions based on culture or religion or strategy or diplomacy. And in those cases, the role of the scientist, again, is not only to come and say, hey, this is what the data says, is hey, can we, how can we understand reality? And then come in, understanding not the ideal situations or the ideal scenarios that the scientists tend to do, but the reality on the ground and then try to move forward. But also society has stopped seeing scientists as someone who provides answers to the real world, but someone who works in an in an ivory tower and talks about things that only themselves understand. Mm -hmm. And that's wrong. I think we need to connect again with the people in a much more pragmatic way. And that's why I, that's why I started working on this. That's why I left the postdoc that I had on rocket science. That's why I left my, my dream job for many people, right? It was not easy. It was really not easy. I brought the book I wish I had when I had those doubts. Mm. That's perfect. Yeah. I think when I was reading your book, I noticed that you were saying science at some point was more effective because earlier scientists were natural philosophers, astronomers and geologists and mathematicians and people of the world. But as it's evolved, we're noticing that things are becoming increasingly siloed and segmented. And and when you just have your specialization, that's all you do. And, you know, that that does happen across industries. And I think we all learn skills, we get excited, we have dreams to use them and inspire people in a field, and then we show up to the job, and those expectations are not met uh, with the same reality. It's actually like, you know, I show up to, to act in a movie and I don't realize, oh, that'll be 5% of what it means to be in the entertainment industry. That's the good 5%. The 95% of the rest of it is admin work, submitting your resume, trying to get a job, staying in class, spending a lot of money, blah, 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 blah. So what were your expectations that initially drew you to science altogether? And what was the reality once you got there? Even before I, I knew how to read, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. I loved knowledge. I loved understanding. There is, there is a certain 
thrill, like mental thrill when you understand something that is complicated. Mm. And when you start talking or under, or studying very complex things, as I was doing, for example, at the end of my research career, I was studying magnetohydrodynamics, which is basically plasma in the sun that it moves because it has a magnetic field. And even the word of, of magnetohydrodynamics sounds cool. And it, it <laughs> gives you a thrill to know that you can understand those things. But at the same time, I felt that that's not what science should be only about. I, I got tired of being in front of the computer and looking at very fundamental research. And then at the same time, seeing all the problems in the world on climate change, on development, on inequalities. And I thought, why, why do I feel so frustrated that I have such a powerful tools to understand the waves in the sun, but I cannot use those skills to understand how to help solve traffic mm. in Philippines, for example. And this is an example that I ended up uh, working when I was at the World Bank. And then I realized the mathematical formulas that I used to understand those waves in the sun are exactly the same as the mathematical formulas to understand how traffic jams are created in highways. Wow. And this is something that blew my mind. Why can we not base our value as skills, not as knowledge? Mm and let it be transferred and translated um, into other exactly. yeah, fields. And of course, innovation often happens at the interface of industries and being able to see everything as analogous um, is an incredible skill that you've had. And I, I do want to touch on um, how those skills helped you traverse leaving research and and suddenly working at you know World Bank and all of these other places doing things that you may not have ever expected yourself to be doing. The, the skills I learned are things like, for example, understanding complexity or breaking down complexity into assumption, assumptions or steps that then you can test or falsify and then try to, to create models to approach more and more into reality. Right. And so you learn the skills of absorbing complexity and making hypotheses and, you know, data science and, and your ability to make very quick math calculations. You also mentioned you presented um, different companies a horizontal and vertical approach. What, did, what do you mean by that? Well, the people that listen to, to your podcast that are scientists are going uh, to feel very identified with this. The more you are a scientist, the more you progress in your career, the more you are framed as such. And then it's extremely hard to get out uh, of that frame of, of being a researcher. And in my case, the moment I, I came out of that frame was with this, this uh, model that I did of vertical and horizontal. And basically, letting, letting someone who is not in your field of research, which in my case was solar physics, and then going into an NGO to say that, hey, I have a very horizontal view in the sense that the skills are very transversal. I can I can apply my skills in many different fields, but then I can go vertical in the sense that I can go as deep as I need to go to try to understand those issues. And basically two days before I had my flight back, I was, I'm, a, I'm Spanish and I was living in the US. And when I quit my postdoc uh, at NASA, I had to leave the country because I don't have a visa to stay. And a couple of days before that, then this NGO say, hey, can you help us figure out? We know that you're a scientist, probably you don't know how to do this because you are a rocket scientist, but we have this problem of this model on climate change. And that's when, uh, for me, those skills, I could apply it very quickly. And I made a quick model that um, they were able to understand because I already had communication skills, which is something many scientists might not uh, have training or know mm -hmm. how to communicate with people. And then that they understood that it's not my knowledge of plasma physics, it was again my skills. I was able to create something quickly that they understood, and then I broke them all. And I was not anymore a crazy NASA, NASA scientist. I was someone who could be useful from day one, mm. but also I could grow to be very useful on day 100. And I'm so glad that you you do know how to communicate and speak someone else's language. And I think a part of that vertical um, model is, yeah, know your audience. If you're speaking to academics, use academic language. If you're speaking to, you know, your mom, maybe you grow up, you grew up in a rural town and you're the first one in your family to have, um, you know, a higher education. When you go back to speak with your family, it can sound really pompous if you just start speaking spouting and spewing 
things that they don't understand but if you simplify it and meet them where they are and 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 I think there's also a beautiful parallel here, too, for everyone listening, the same way that Bruno recognized that he had so many skills that could be um, redirected in other fields. I encourage you to take a moment right now and list out all of the skills that you have. They can be interpersonal. They can be professional, academic, whatever. And then think about how you would use them to, say, approach a totally different industry, believing that you could learn the details of the job on the job, but trusting that your skills actually can be applied somewhere else. I think when we do this, we tap into our creativity. We tap into um, tools that allow us to empower ourselves. So we feel, you know, we feel like we're not stuck in our situation. But if you are out there and you're going, I think I do need to change careers or I'm not fulfilled in this this place and I can do more with this skill, list them out. So one of the things you mentioned that I think is crucial on the skills is also the empathy. And mm-hmm. you you many times talk about the, also the value of empathy and understanding the audience and coming starting from there, not from where you are. Mm-hmm. I had the opportunity through my work to sit down in front of head of states or sit down with technical people or not technical people. My family, I'm, I'm the first one in my family to go to, mm. to have a PhD. I, my, my father is a drummer and my, and my mother is a secretary in the hospital. And when I try to explain them uh, what I do, if they don't understand it, it's because I'm not explaining myself properly. Mm. Like, this is a wrong assumption that saying I don't understand means that you don't understand is your problem. But in most cases, you don't understand because the person trying to explain it is not explaining it properly mm. or doesn't have the time or doesn't care. If I have the IPCC report, which is the climate change, this UN, United Nations uh, uh, report on climate change, and I have read it and I understood it because I'm a scientist, I cannot go to a head of a state or to my mom and say, hey, climate change is happening, read the report. <laughs> because it's just not going to work because they don't have the time or the engagement to do that. And right. the value of empathizing to where they are, how much time they have, how much, how many worries they have, how they relate to this problem, then use your skills to go for where they are and then explain the relevance of this or how they can integrate what they know into, into this issue of climate change. It's an example that I have to feel fair. Mm, so good. Um, and so can you help break down the vulnerability and readiness index that you, you contributed to? So this was um, this was in the context of climate change in, in particular, and this was 2009, 2010. Uh, climate change, uh, to say it very quickly, is the fact that uh, emitting CO2 in our cars and our factories has to, to change the climate patterns. And one of the effects is getting it warmer. That's what many people call it uh, uh, global warming, mm. but also to have extreme events. And the extreme events like flooding or droughts are the ones that are gonna drive a lot of the cost and a lot of the deaths on, on the, of these extreme events. So when, when we face climate change, we can do two things. We can stop emitting, that's the mitigation, but also adapt. Adaptation is to recognize that even if we stop emitting today, which we cannot because we depend on our transportation, our heating, everything depends on emitting some quantity for a few years, then we need to adapt. And adaptation is considered like the bad thing. It's like if you are getting fat, then you buy bigger clothes. No, if you're getting fat, you need to stop eating. And in that sense, adaptation was considered the, the bad thing to do. I was working on adaptation because I understood that the reality means we need to adapt, and the private sector. So this model that I did on readiness and vulnerability was how can we understand the role of adaptation and the role of the private sector in climate change. The private sector has always been seen as the the one who should pay the bill, the, mm. the, the one to blame on climate change. But the mm. reality is that every single CO2 they emit is because we buy it. So we, it's easy to, to criticize the companies for the emissions they have, but they all sell it to us. Mm-hmm. They, so we need to understand those uh, the incentives and change it. So the readiness model was basically to separate uh, how, much, how, how is our vulnerability at the level of the country, at the exposure to the climate change, the sensitivity, like kilometers of coast or the temperature, those kind of things, but then recognize that in order to, uh, to do something, we should have a readiness to act in, so, and to understand 
can we are we knowledgeable of the problems we have can we move quickly do we have for example can we start businesses or startups that work on climate change easily so those were the two things that we made and typically most ngos or most people working in the environment they only work on the vulnerability side mm. on the environment side right. not on the readiness side and most most economists they work on the readiness side but not so much on the vulnerability mm. so the beauty of this model was to combine the two the u.s Actually, the U.S., uh, because it has been a few years, probably the U.S. is worse than it used to be for obvious reasons, like, for example, the decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement, mm. um, but also because the U.S. Con uh, emits the most CO2 per capita, per person. Wow. In general, it's China, the one that emits the most. Um, but if you divide by the number of people, the U.S. is uh, substantially the worst country in terms of emission per person. So we're less vulnerable to the harmful effects of climate change. We're readier technologically than developing countries, yet we're not playing our proportionate role in mitigating what we're responsible for. Yeah, that's, the, that's the, also the double inequality, the injustice of the situation is that we are not, the U.S. is not the most vulnerable by far, but also is the one that emits the most. So the, the poorer countries that are also vulnerable, they are also the ones that are less ready. Mm -hmm. So there's a double injustice, like countries that emit, not doesn't emit much, they're also the ones that there are very vulnerable. Think of Ethiopia, think of Nigeria, think of I don't know, Nicaragua, all these places that are very vulnerable to the weather events, but also they have not really emitted most of those emissions. So that's uh, what the double injustice comes from. I want to take a quick break, um, but when we come back, I'm going to ask you all about moonshot factories, failure culture, uh, climate change a little bit more, and then this whole anti-science movement that's happening in the West. So stay tuned, everyone. I just got Cosbox, and I need to tell you about it. It's a quarterly subscription box curated by women for women with products that are ethical, sustainable, have a positive mission to give back and make the world better, and are more than 70% off retail. Every cause box is limited edition. The last four boxes sold out within days, um, and they just launched a new version that has over $290 worth of items for 50 bucks. For reference, my winter box had an $120 woven throw blanket, reversible mittens, uh, two mugs that support victims of domestic violence, a jewelry box that provides backpacks for children, clean, cruelty-free daily hair vitamins, earrings, serving spoons, and more. And the holidays are upon us, so I think this makes for an amazing gift that just keeps on giving. Just go to www.causebox.com and use the code STONER to get your first box for just $35 and grab it before it's gone. So go to C-A-U-S-E-B-O-X.com and use the code STONER. Welcome back. We're chatting with Bruno on impact science, making science truly valuable to society and not just a million articles that amuse or scare us and then collect dust. So, Bruno, in your book, you explain a term called moonshot thinking. What is it? We tend to think of science as the free play of the free intellect, that the best science is when we leave scientists alone. Mm. And then they explore and research, and then we get value from that, and long-term value. And that is true. But there are cases where we really need, for example, we really need to get to the moon. Or we really need to stop the CFC, like the ozone layer. Or we need to do things, and we know what the goal is. And that's what I call moonshots, when we have a clear deadline. And when you look at those cases and the study of those cases, you realize that the way we reach to those moonshots, or for example, the, the moonshot of creating the atomic bomb, uh, we was, it was a clear scientific problem that had to be solved because of the, if not the Nazis, we could have got the atomic bomb. So we knew we had to get that and or going to the moon. In those cases, the way we get there is not by the free play of the free intellect, it's by being extremely laser focused on 
advancing in that particular path. Mm. And in the case of the of the moonshot, it was even almost a military approach. Mm. The uncomfortable truth is that it's not about pushing science to the limits and then that is progress of society. It's pulling from the goal. We cannot have a push mentality of just doing research because it's interested in the general direction we want to go. We have to be ruthless to say, how can we solve? How can we get to the moon? Okay, we get to the moon, we need rockets. What kind of rockets? We need this kind of rockets. What else do we need? We need to go. What is the, the, the window of time to do it? How can we build all those steps? And if you look at how the private sector is approaching moonshots, it's very similar. If you look at Google Brain, you Google, look at X from Google. Again, you look at in, in Princeton, sorry, no, in Stanford, they have also these, um, these labs and they approach it in a similar way to which is very much focused on the result and then pulling from the present. And, and as you said, just to sort of summarize, moonshot thinking often happens when it's tied to political, economic, or other strategic agendas um, that are already pre-existing. So not the free play of the free intellect necessarily, but actually knowing we have to get there by this deadline and then using a rigorously, you know, organized management system of getting those um, steps to actually be accomplished in time. And so you mentioned, you brought up X and, um, and Google Brain. These are examples of you know, moonshot factories, so to speak, they use a tool called failure culture. What is failure culture and, and how could we maybe even apply this in our lives? The failure culture is one of these techniques they use to advance quickly, which is to recognize that failure is part of, of progress and you should not hide from it. Try yourself to make it fail. Try to recognize when you're failing and the fact that you discover that it failed is progress in itself. So in, in the case of X, the uh, Munso factory of Google, they do that. They have a, a team, even themselves, but they have an extra a special team whose whole job is to try to make the projects fail. And if they succeed in doing that, they get a bonus, which is, seems crazy <laughs> that you get a, a bonus when you fail the project. But think about it. It's way better to recognize you failed today that next year because then you have spent a whole year in something that you today could have realized that it was a failure. Mm. And switching back to impact science, what are some examples of when impact science has actually made a difference and gotten it right? <laughs> there is an example I use sometimes. Um, when babies are born preterm, before the uh, nine months, the survival rate it's um, is 90% for our countries and is 10% for developing countries. When I say our, I mean uh, Europe, the US, uh, the Western world. And the reason is that we have incubators. So when the baby is born preterm, we put the baby into the incubator and then that makes a 90% survival rate. And in developing countries, they don't have these things. So the survival rate goes down to 10%. And even if they had incubators, because there are programs that put, uh, or philanthropies or NGOs that put incubators into these countries, there's no electricity, or it breaks down and they know how to use it. Or there are cases that the reality on the ground is that it just doesn't work. So an impact scientist um, is someone who understands that problem then tries to use the skill. Now the knowledge they might have, the skills to try to solve this issue. And the babies, what they need is constant temperature. So what we need to do is to find something that melts at the temperature the baby needs. We just need to find a wax that melts at that temperature. So all you need to do is to heat up that wax, make it liquid, wrap the baby with that with a cloth that has inside this these works and then you are guaranteed by the laws of physics by science that that baby is going to have constant temperature for hours until the whole works is solidified again because it's cooling down wow it's that simple it's a concept that we all have but because we don't think about those skills of how we can solve it. We don't have this framework of trying to figure out those solutions. We don't know. And that's to everyone. This, this is, I'm not the first one who thinks about this. This is uh, Jane Chen from Stanford who figured this out and they made a company called Embrace. And Embrace is literally 
walks in plastified with a plastic or wrap, that then you do exactly that, and then you 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 can buy them and and you can also donate them, and then deploy them in developing countries, and it's literally saving millions of babies with a scientific concept that we all have in our heads, and I wonder how many other things we all know we could solve, wow. but we don't because it's siloed, it's trapped in these knowledge silos. And if we knew how to get those skills out and use them properly, how many lives of people could be safe? And what's exciting about that is everyone is an expert in their own experience. So there's a, a trick or an exercise that actors use called um, playing to the top of your intelligence. And it's an improv game, and you're given a scenario about something you think you know nothing about, but you have to play to the top of your intelligence. And you automatically start realizing that at some point or another, you might have heard a commercial about the topic, you might have heard your parent uh, say something when you were a kid about it, you might have heard someone walking down the street mention it, you saw a billboard, whatever, and you pull as many details forward word or you know if you if you hear a term term and you go well I think it sounds like something else I've learned then you start realizing that you know more than you're giving yourself credit and to trust your experience trust that you you have something to offer that is unique and valuable to every single situation that you approach and it will be slightly different from the person next to you but together that's where that innovation really gets brought to life and i love that the example of the the melting wax is is a perfect representation of that. Now, we talked about the the good times. What are the bad times with impact science? What are some of the the times that we've sort of gotten it wrong or we're still trying to figure it out? I'm guessing climate change is one of those. Yeah, I, I think climate change is, is very much one that is currently happening and I wish, and that's what I'm working to try to figure out how to, to use this framework to, to help in these situations. Um, climate change is one. HIV AIDS uh, is a crisis that we had, especially in the US, that we failed. Science failed to say it very quickly. It started killing a lot of people, but because it had a lot of social stigma, because it affected mostly or primarily drug users or gay, the gay community, it was not um, investigated as it should be. Uh, because something that could, you could not come build your scientific career, mm. then it swung to the other side because so many people had this uh, getting this disease that a Nobel Prize was at stake. And then two competing teams in the US and France were competing for, for solving, uh, discovering a, a treatment. Mm. To me, it's a failure that we have constructed a science process by which we don't collaborate as much as we could. And in fact, I just think how many lives we could have saved by not having these two teams work collaborating together instead of fighting each other. Or sometimes when we, we think we are doing the right thing, but because we are not uh, really figuring out the consequences of our science, then we have unintended bad consequences. That is the case of leaded gas. Um, there's a story in the book about the person who discovered why adding lead was really good for for the gas, but also how adding lead to the tin cans. And also the same guy that invented the CFCs, the, 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 the freon and all that stuff that created the ozone layer, the ozone hole. It's a, it's, this particular person had a, a really big impact in the world uh, because of the unintended consequences of his. That you're referring to Midgley? Yes, sorry, yeah. Midley. Uh, Midley, and is the person uh, um, he was a he was a really good engineer, but he himself is responsible probably of the most damage in the wow. environment in the history of humankind. And as I was working through your book, I saw time after time when someone was, uh, you know, pressured to find a solution for something. So in in the short term, they did. And then in the long term, realized that the impact was so harmful that they actually start advocating, lobbying, working against that which they created. And, and that's just, uh, it, it just shows us that we could be, you know, more ethical and, and moral about how we approach things um and like you said with um with hiv and aids 
there was less funding because it was targeting, you know, an ostracized demographic, a population that uh, wasn't receiving the same care and concern and, and support. But then also business got involved and status got involved. And in one way, yeah, that helped, you know, jumpstart um, more people trying to find the solution because they saw, you know, there was some clout at stake. But on the other side, instead of sharing all of the information along the way, they went, I'm still trying to get the credit for this. So, you know, we're all going to stay siloed until one of us, you know, gets the cheese. And it's like, really, really, are you, are we that disconnected from the human being and the heartbeat on the other side of this issue whose, whose life is truly at stake? So I think that, that, that takes us to the point that industry really is such a giant in all of this, especially with climate change. How can we, you know, the average consumer look at businesses today and hold them accountable without ignoring all of the huge factors of like, you know, we'd lose jobs if you wipe out that sector. Um, Also, the fact that we are totally materially dependent with our everyday lifestyles, especially here in the West. Um, How do how should we look at business then? And what businesses should we support? I think it's it's changing a lot. Um, Part of it is social media. Before, there was no communication back to the companies. Right now, um, there is companies or brands, they care about their consumers and what they say. And this is an extreme, to me, it's an extremely important step. Care about what you buy. You vote not only once every few years, if you live in a democracy, you also vote every time you buy something. Every dollar you spend, is a boat for the kind of world you want to live in. So mm. if you know two different products and you have the choice to, to get the one that is more environmentally friendly, that matters, and that matters a lot. Mm. But at the same time, do it in a way that it, if it conflicts with your reality, like for example, oh yes, I, I care about the environment, but I don't have enough money and I need to put gas in the cheapest gas station, I can, that's reality. That's fine. Don't feel bad about it. But just talk about it and figure it out. Hey, we need a solution. Being environmentally conscious is not only something wealthy people can do. Do you think for those who can afford to swap even one toxic industrial product with an eco-friendly one, that we could slowly shift supply and demand and have you know, more eco-friendly products than holding a greater share of the markets and actually shift Absolutely. the whole? Absolutely. And then... Um, not only doing that choice, but explaining why you make that choice. When I mm. when I choose not to eat as much meat that I used to eat it, for environmental reasons, I, I if someone asks me, I explain them why that is the case. And it's not that I'm attacking their choices. I love meat. I am in Spanish. I love jamón. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I recognize that eating less is good for the environment. So having those those choices, personal choices, and, and sharing why you make these choices is very important. It matters a lot. And I think whether you are wanting to start your own business or you're wanting to be smarter about the businesses you support, start looking for what Bruno suggested in his book, which is a company that can be for profit, but is also good for the planet and good for people. Those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. If you're wanting, you know, to start a business, you don't have to do that at the expense of the environment or people's well-being. You just have to be a little bit more thorough about how you approach things. Um, So just one final area that I want to kind of jump into before a few just fun last questions there's this whole anti-science movement happening in the west what do we do about it it's it's very worrying to see that uh, we can create these counter facts that change something that used not to not to be a problem what's happening here i think is that we put in too much emphasis on just the facts being the the trust in itself or the important thing. And if if facts are the source of trust, then anyone can create whatever facts they want and then you can fake it. 
But if we start to think about who is saying what and what uh, what are the basis for doing that, or if we trust them, and then that starts to change. Um, yeah, and I think that's also circling back to playing to the top of your intelligence. You're able to go, okay, wait, I've actually sorted through some of these things in my own time, and I'm starting to recognize my own skills. So now I have a, a better way of processing this information, and I can go, ah. Eh, this seems fishy. This doesn't seem right. Uh, let's exactly. check in a little further. Yeah. So, you know, I think in our own ways, most of us want to make a change with our lives. Um, what are the qualities of someone who inspires themselves and others into action? I think passion, like being able to convey your passion for something goes a long way. And I hope that um, the way I speak transpired the passion I feel about this idea of the value of skills versus the value of knowledge, the value of pushing scientists to be more engaged with reality. Mm. Um, inspiring people is something that um, can change life. So the qualities of people that I look for is the ability to communicate properly and communicate with passion mm. and care about what they're doing. It is much harder to go from the brain to the heart than from the heart to the brain. So don't try to change people just telling facts try to change people starting with why should they change? What should they care? What should they engage? Why should they feel something about this issue? I agree. Passion is infectious. And even if someone at first is like, I don't know why, but I just enjoy being around this person, eventually you can start deepening what the content of your conversations are. But beginning with that sense of, hey, I am, I'm excited about this. I'm jazzed. You know, there's an energetic buzz around you as you're talking about things you're passionate about. That really is inviting and it, it sparks other people. So the last question I have for you today, if, if impact scientists aren't necessarily just in labs anymore, and we ourselves want to be one, where is our place in society? Where is the impact scientist's place in society? And that also means what's currently on your plate? Where are you at? And what's the next thing on your agenda? So if, um, if sci the, the place of a scientist is not only in a lab, where is it? Anywhere, everywhere. Like, why don't we, why don't we have a scientist in our NGOs, in our governments, in mm. our companies, in anywhere? Like, we need these kind of scientists engaged with the world. And if we are able to find them or train them or make them, then this, the place for these people is everywhere. And mm. I work in the public sector. I work in the private sector, in academia. And I had so much fun in all of these places because I came with the idea of really trying to understand and, and help people move forward and that's what I keep I continue doing I recently spent um, three months in the Balkans in Europe trying to help startup companies um, progress what I saw in in the Balkans which is um, is the case in many post-communist countries is that they are technically very good but they don't have that much idea of business models or product or marketing so I spent the last two months uh, there working with them. Before that, I I work in, in Africa, also trying to help uh, groups of people integrate scientists and be more effective in in, uh, in NGOs or in government. So it's it's very fun to try to to do this work of of placing taking a scientist out of where they are and then putting them in a different place and making them useful. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And that will only happen if we really work together. And at the end of the day, that's what, what matters. What can we collaborate and work together to, to build and co-create? Agreed. Well, I'm sure many people have been inspired and also want to support you. They can find you at um, Bruno San. Dot eu. Um, you can also check out his book, Impact Science, and I will be giving away several copies. So tune in for more info there. I'm really thrilled. I'm so grateful that you you donated this much of your time um, to us and simplified the complexity of impact science for us. But thank you again so much. Have a great rest of your day. Likewise. Thank you, Mary Mansalis. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I'm a millennial, and all my friends, cousins, and co-workers seem to be tying the knot. Marriage sounds stressful enough to me, but wedding planning seems even harder. Luckily, 
Zola has helped over 1 million couples get married, and they have everything you need to plan yours. Zola makes it easier and less stressful, providing wedding websites, registry, invites, designs, discounts, tools like a handy guest list manager, and answers to frequently asked questions like, uh, should we invite the kids or no? So go find your perfect wedding paper suites, those affordable cards, all the things you haven't even thought of yet. Sign up at Zola.com slash stoner today to get your free personalized paper sample. Then use code SAVE50 to get 50% off your save the dates. That's Zola.com slash stoner and promo code SAVE50, S-A-V-E-5-0. Till death do us part. Mm. It's easy to overlook quality sleep and chiropractic alignment when it comes to self-care basics. But who are we if we're so doggone tired and sleep deprived that our bodies, minds, and spirits aren't even functioning? When I discovered Purple Mattress, I was most intrigued by their unique material and technology that gives a zero gravity-like feel no matter what sleeping position you're in, while also being simultaneously firm, soft, and breathable. So I encourage you to consider whether a new, more advanced and comfortable mattress might be helpful for you. Purple Mattress offers free in-home setup and old mattress removal, a 100-night risk-free trial, money-back guarantee, 10-year warranty, and free shipping and returns. You'll love Purple. And right now, Simplexity listeners get a free Purple pillow with the purchase of a mattress. That's in addition to the great free gifts they're offering site-wide. Just text SIMPLEXITY to 84 888. The only way to get this free pillow is to text S I M P L E X I T Y to 84888. That's simplexity to 84888. Ah. So amazing. Are you as impassioned as I am right now? Bruno is so compelling and also relatable. For that, I am grateful. And now it's time for this week's mantras. I'll say each twice, and then you can repeat them after me. Go ahead, write them down, recite them daily. Use them to reshape and reprogram your conscious mind toward your optimal self and brightest future. Because at the end of the day, if you don't activate your full potential, man, What could we be doing in this world if we were all actually at our fullest potential? So step into it. Number one, I share my passion openly and inspire others to do the same. I share my passion openly and inspire others to do the same. Number two, my skills are useful in infinite ways and situations. My skills are useful in infinite ways and situations. And lastly, I communicate so others understand, not just to be heard. I communicate so others understand, not just to be heard. Thank you for journeying to space and back with me today. Uh, Hey, if you've been listening and you like what you hear, please do share this with your friends and family and teachers, coworkers, whomever. Please also take a second right now to rate and review the podcast. That helps act as a mini billboard for us while we're growing. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe so you're first to hear every week's episode. Much love. I'm Allison Stoner, and thanks for listening to Simplexity. It's anything but small talk. Peace.